Pakistan under fire as it returns thousands of Afghan refugees, even the UN being accused of assisting expulsions. What's behind the mass repatriations and how's Afghanistan dealing with the influx? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Thousands of people born and raised in Pakistan are being forced to uproot their lives. Their destination? Afghanistan, a war-torn country they've never known. After decades of hosting Afghan refugees, the Pakistani government says they're a security threat and have to go home. Around 600,000 have moved back to Afghanistan. For months, rights groups have criticized Pakistani government policy. Well, now Human Rights Watch is going after the UN too, accusing the UN's refugee agency of complicity in abuses. It says the UNHCR condoned the Pakistani government's behavior by not standing up to it, and that it was unethical to offer money to refugees who leave because it compelled them to return to an unsafe country. Well, Human Rights Watch says Pakistan violated international law by forcing thousands of refugees to go to Afghanistan, and that Pakistani police blackmailed and illegally detained Afghans still in Pakistan. The rights group has called on Pakistan to extend refugee visas until 2019. Well, that doesn't seem likely to happen, though. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, Mohammed Val reports. When the Safi family went to Pakistan 40 years ago, fleeing Soviet occupation, they were five in number. Now they're 35. The parents died and these are the children and grandchildren, all but three of them born and raised in Pakistan. Now they say Pakistan has forced them to leave. We've been living like thieves. If we wanted to go outside, we had to choose the routes where there were no police to avoid being arrested. If we were intercepted, we'd have to bribe the police or face being arrested. The return of this family is part of a massive operation that began last year. According to a Human Rights Watch report, Pakistan has been home to around 2 million Afghan refugees for most of the last 40 years. In the second half of 2016, the report says 365,000 registered refugees were pushed out by a toxic combination of deportation threats and police abuses. About 200,000 undocumented Afghan refugees in Pakistan returned in the same period. Human Rights calls the exodus the world's largest unlawful mass forced return of refugees in recent times. The report accuses the UN's refugee agency, UNHCR, of having promoted the forced return by giving cash to refugees who were willing to return and by failing to provide them with accurate and up-to-date information on conditions in Afghanistan. I think it's fair to characterize it as a, as a looming crisis. Um, given the record high number of returnees in 2016 and the predictions of similarly, similarly high or higher uh, numbers of returns of both undocumented and refugee returnees in 2017, uh, combined with the record level of internal displacement caused by conflict, natural disasters, and other issues, um, I think we're looking at a very serious humanitarian challenge. Relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan are poor, with each country accusing the other of harboring armed opponents. Some suggest Pakistan is trying to put pressure on Afghanistan through a massive expulsion of refugees. The Turkham border crossing is constantly choked with returnees. It's the peak of winter. Most of these people are in utter destitution. We are living in a very difficult situation now. Our children are not studying anymore. We don't have a job. We've lost everything that we've had. We have to start our life from beginning. I pray to God that he would make it easy for us. The Safis are originally from Kunar province, one of the strongholds of the Taliban. But they're not willing to go there. Instead, they're seeking to rent a house here in Nangarhar. They feel totally helpless here, but say they have no choice. Mohamed Val, Al Jazeera.
Let's get the thoughts of our guests now. Joining us in Kabul is Fauzia Kufi. She is a member of the Afghan parliament in Islamabad. Ayaz Wazir, former Pakistani ambassador to Afghanistan. And in Geneva, we have Ariane Rumery, a senior communications officer at the UNHCR. Welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start, if we can, with Ayaz. Repatriation through coercion, threats and abuse. Is that how Pakistan is returning refugees? Well, I'm afraid all is not true. There may be some element like the police treatment with the Afghan refugees, but let's not forget that the refugees were living for so long and they had, some of them had no travel document or identification paper on them, though they were told many a times to get one, prepare one, or then go back. Well, this is how uh, Human Rights Watch doing anything. is saying. One they, they say they've documented, investigated, and they say these are not a few isolated incidents. They mention cases, they say, of Afghan refugees being raided at night, their stuff thrown on the floor, um, their stuff even stolen sometimes, and told their refugee cards had expired and they should go home. Well, this is what I said, that those were mostly uh, those Afghan refugees who had no document on them. Some may be uh, uh, mistreated, those who had document on them, but uh, these are mostly those who had no document on them. And they were told repeatedly, let's not forget the political situation at that time. Uh, Pakistan was trying to... Uh, do the border management in agreement with the Afghan government, but somehow that uh, uh, didn't uh, take place the way Pakistan wanted to. And we had a very bad experiment at uh, Torham where one Pakistani major got killed and one Afghan soldier got killed. So the tension certainly was there. The political, uh, the governments in the two capitals were not as uh, uh, on, on, on uh, good wavelength as they were before. So there was a tension. The air was tight, I would say, full of tension. And let's not forget uh, the tilt that was uh, fast uh, moving towards uh, uh, India, on which Pakistan has serious concerns. So these were the something that were cooking up in the air, and that has certainly contributed to the ejection of the undocumented Afghan refugees from Pakistan. And right. as I said, right. some mistreatment or force may have been used by the police, uh, but that, that happens in such a big number of people if they All refuse right. let, to let go me, back. Let me jump in here and take the, the point to Ariane. Maybe some cases of mistreatment, Ayan says, but the finger of blame being pointed as well at the UNHCR itself with Human Rights Watch saying, the UNHCR is complicit in what it's calling forced returns. Are you failing to stand up to bullying, as they put it? Well, UNHCR shares concerns about the pressures, particularly in the late summer, which affected the repatriation program last year. Uh, but we don't agree with the conclusions in the latest report, uh, and certainly not the claims made against UNHCR. I think it's important to understand the drivers. And we did have a very huge surge in the number of returns, 370,000 registered refugees went back last year and that was a massive increase from the previous years and the drivers behind those are complex and they're multiple and they and they relate to the shifting regional dynamics uh, which the previous guest has actually referred to. UNHCR has actually done extensive monitoring. We do interviews on both sides of the border. Uh, most recently we did an analysis of the reasons behind the return based on more than 4,200 interviews and dozens of focus groups. And the things were certainly the pressure, which was amidst the security tensions at the time, is there. Also, things like uh, um, uh, the changes in the, the border controls at Torquem border, which have disrupted much of the trade, um, what was very much a porous border until, until recently, and disrupted family ties, changing attitudes, Afghans have mentioned. Uh, they've also mentioned a campaign by the government of Afghanistan to encourage people to come home, the promise of land, and so on. There's no doubt. That well, Afghans have faced then, very Ariane. tough choices you said you've done some in where they can best find protection at this time. Interviews. How prevalent are you saying that abuse has been as a factor or an, an instance in the cases of returnees? Are you saying that Human Rights Watch are actually not accurate in painting 
a picture where abuse is so common in the reasons why people are returning? It is certainly a factor and if you look at the reasons of the most cited factors in the first half of 2016, it was economic hardship. And in the second half of the year, that declined as a factor and there was an increase in fear of arrest and abuse and there's no doubt that that was a factor. And UNHCR has intervened in almost 6,000 cases of uh, unlawful arrest and detention and we've got the release of uh, almost all of those in fact working with the local authorities. So there's no doubt that was a factor, particularly in the late summer, and those instances of arrest then declined. But there were also other factors, and it is really a very complex picture on why people have returned. But I think the important thing is not so much to focus on the differences and who said what, but to understand what are the drivers behind such a huge increase in returns last year, which did, at that pace, far outstrip Afghanistan's capacity to absorb that many people and to offer services and to help them reintegrate so many years, in fact, decades of exile, after decades of exile. All right, let's take that point to Fozia in Kabul, in the Afghan capital. What are Afghan authorities doing for people who are leaving Pakistan? Are you providing them with housing? Are they getting access to basic services, health, education? What about Dare they dream of employment or vocational training? Well, I think um, on your question of what the government uh, is doing for them, perhaps the government officials might be the right people, as I'm the member of parliament on behalf of people I can speak. And what, what I could say is um, that uh, the, the refugee is an unfortunate product of war. And the other unfortunate thing is that the refugee issue has always, or in most cases, has been used politically against um, uh, the government of Afghanistan in different years. Recently, we have experienced not only from Pakistan, but also from our other neighboring countries that the issue of refugee and their massive deportation has been used politically to basically, to the large extent, uh, pressurize the Afghan government and of course the refugees that return back to Afghanistan they are Afghans and we as people welcome so, them hang on, hang and on of if course I may we jump have to uh, for a look moment at there, ways Fosia. when on you say which that we have they've to been, Afghan refugees have been uh, politicized does that indicate are you conceding that perhaps Afghan authorities have sometimes looked at them as rather than simply as people but as a tool being attempted to be manipulated by Pakistan and therefore not cooperating, as Ayaz was saying, with Pakistani authorities, in his opinion, who were trying to, to present a more coordinated uh, effort to returning these people. No, actually my point is absolutely the other way around. My point is that um, uh, in many occasions we have seen that there has been massive deportation of refugees, even with legal documents, and that has been ba basically on the political mode and the political season of our neighboring countries' relations with Afghanistan. In 2016, there has been more um, eagerness and more push also by the government of Pakistan to deport Afghans. And of course, um, there has been many f driving uh, factors behind this. Few were mentioned by UNHCR. I would like, as a practical experience on the ground, would like to add a few more things that were the driven factors behind the massive deportation and the massive return of refugees from Pakistan and also from Iran. Um, I think um, uh, there has been an unwelcoming environment by Pakistani people as well towards refugees recently because we know that even in the past years uh, the police of Pakistan and the authorities um, uh, recently has not been very much welcoming and supporting the Afghan refugees but there was certain protection by Pakistan people and communities towards refugees but recently that protection and uh, support and that uh, hospitality that was given to Afghans during the time of war and conflict was not there and therefore a lot of Afghans were interested to, to come back to their countries. Now, in Afghanistan, because I said before, it has been as a political tool to pressurize Afghan government, certainly as a country that has gone through four, four decades of war, we need to have in, um, enough resources to sustainably and economically reintegrate these refugees um, through vocational skills, but also um, uh, right. settle them in their 
a place of origin uh, where they left uh, the country. And that, of course, um, needs a lot of re resources and a lot of coordination. And Afghan government as a country, uh, as a go government that has just started to uh, move on the, or stand on their feet, will not be able to, uh, to carry on this huge operation by itself. That is a good point. I want to take it back to Ariane before we go to Ayaz. Two and a half million people, two and a half million people, Ariane, we're told, are projected to return over the next 18 months. That's according to a report by the IMF. Um, is there enough international support for that kind of number of returnees in a, in a country that's torn to pieces by war, uh, suffers from poverty, lack of basic infrastructure? The list goes on and on and on, doesn't it? Well, there's no doubt there needs to be international support and sustained political and financial support to ensure that the the gradual and we need a more gradual return of refugees to Afghanistan is actually connected to longer term development programs as well as efforts to bolster peace and security. Uh, it's important uh, as the, uh, the Member of Parliament from Afghanistan said that uh, there's support for these government led programs which uh, we need to have progress on. These are, these are Afghans returning to Afghanistan who are going to need uh, access to land, to shelter, to livelihoods, to education, very importantly, to rebuild their future. And more, more broadly, uh, uh, international support for the broader programs. And I note that last October in Brussels, $15.2 billion was pledged to Afghanistan. And it's very important that those pledges, uh, we see early action making those pledges into government-led programs that can improve the situation, not just for returning refugees, but for all Afghans and in the internally displaced people. Let's not forget there's uh, increasing numbers of internally displaced people, um, un undocumented and documented returnees and, and for all Afghans. So absolutely the uh, important political and financial support from the international community and sustained over many years will be absolutely crucial. All right, so perhaps there's not enough uh, preparation on the Afghan side of the border. I wonder, Ayaz, has this been thought out properly in terms of the impact on the Pakistani side of the border? And the reason I ask that, I looked up here, the, there are statements by senior members of the business community in Pakistan, like Zahid Allah Shinwari, the senior vice president of the Pakistan-Afghan Joint Chamber of Commerce. People like him are worried about 80% loss of skilled manpower for industry on the Pakistani side of the border if these people are, are being pushed out too quickly. Has this been thought through uh, well enough, never mind about the impact and implications on Afghan refugees, the impact on local Pakistani communities and businesses? Well, certainly we have uh, lost that manpower, but uh, let's not forget that our own people in that region are as poor, most of them, as the Afghan refugees uh, were or they still are. But this so is what the, Zahid Allah uh, says, says we, we, uh, there should have been a program to train some of the local people rather than to just so quickly push out the Afghans. Well, the local people are, as I said, as trained equally as the Afghan refugees were. There were nothing special about their uh, learning some special skills. They, they were uh, mostly uh, ordinary labor, as skilled in some uh, instances as the Pakistanis in that region are skilled. So the, the deficiency is not felt that much, but certainly there was... Uh, uh, a gap a bit, uh, but mostly I would say that was for the Afghan refugee, the shock, the economic uh, difficulties for them, not for the Pakistanis. The Pakistanis, yes, lost the rental part of it where the houses were uh, given to them on rent or some trade was going on illegal through them or because of them. Or another uh, big aspect was the medical treatment of the people from Afghanistan, the relative of the refugees used to come and stay with them. So these things certainly have affected, but well, that is a part of the refugee uh, uh, business. If they are coming, they bring in some good things, some bad things, and when they are leaving, it, it happens again the same way. Uh, otherwise, if you look at it, the human relationship, they were living with us for the last 40 years. We hardly felt they were people from other country. Interaction was so close and uh, we trusted each other. We had no problem uh, from security point of view from them. 
uh, and when they were right. leaving, I think the Pakistanis living close by with them were more sad for them than the Afghan refugees going All right, let, let me uh, go to Fauzia in Kabul. If people are not taken care of properly when they return to Afghanistan, and we're, we're talking about potentially millions of people being returned, uh, a large number of people already internally displaced, what happens to these people? And do they become a source of further instability? Do they feed into the Taliban rebellion? Well, the main concern is that um, if these people not, are not properly and in a sustainable way reintegrated into their society, um, education opportunities are not provided to their children, and um, a job and life skills are not provided to them, the, the main concern is that they become um, a, a, a ready kind of ready tool for Taliban and other elements of insurgency in Afghanistan, including Daesh. Um, that they could easily use them because if people are in search of food and they don't have food, they could be easily, of course, hired by any group. But also let me relate to um, my friend from Pakistan on uh, the situation of um, uh, Pakistanis who live on the other side of the border. I fully agree with him that the situation of people in Pakistan living in the other side of the border is not as good as uh, the ones who return back to Afghanistan. And I think this is basically as a product of, Af of war, four decades of war in Afghanistan that also impacted the situation in Pakistan. Um, but also I think this, the, the lack of attention of um, the main decision-making body in Pakistan towards this crisis also to the great extent um, uh, uh, impacted the situation. And I think this is a time, given what's happening in the, both sides of the border in Afghanistan and Pakistan, given the fact that the uh, health, education, uh, infrastructures, job opportunities, economic opportunities is broken down in the two countries. I think it's the time for Afghan and Pakistan government mainly to honestly and thoroughly come to the peace process. And I think uh, this is a, an opportunity for me also to ask up, uh, Pakistan politicians and civil society to pressurize their governments. If we know this is a crisis, if we know that the both countries are affected, then let's honestly get involved in, in, in peace process and support a genuine peace in, in the two countries because we know that the two countries um, uh, correlate with each other's problems and, and successes. On the meantime, I think uh, I fully agree on the issue of border management. Uh, border management is a crucial issue. We have to talk, look at this issue as non-political, but rather a, uh, as an issue that you know, to the great extent, fuel the uh, the conflicts in Afghanistan. I think um, the issue of refugee recently has become more politicized. We know that there are people in, uh, who lived in Pakistan for years without documents, but it was only a few months ago that the issue of Sharbat Gula, the very famous uh, um, a blue eye uh, or green eye uh, woman who actually came um, and, and she was jailed. We all know about this. So I think the attitude has become more political from our okay, neighbors when it comes to the refugees. No doubt. And th therefore, uh, right. the massive deportation We've started. We've just got about a minute and a half left, and I want to give it, if I may, to Ariane and ask this question. What happens to people once they leave? Uh, Afghan refugees who leave Pakistan, from your perspective, does their status end as refugees? Do you still track them? What if they go back to no, virtually no, no resources, no housing? Um, do you consider them to be to remain on your book, so to speak, in some capacity or another? Yeah, well, once a refugee returns to their country, uh, for the particularly, uh, we do keep an eye on them, and UNHCR does have programs uh, to help returning refugees. We do actually monitor them. In fact, part of this uh, this interview study I mentioned earlier, UNHCR recently did a telephone survey, for example, with 1,300 of the people who returned last year, three months after so what if they want uh, to went back, back to Harry Afghanistan, uh, and we're looking at ways to to further increase that. Some, some of the things that we found in that survey was that uh, about 52% of people went back to their areas of origin and about 48% went to different areas for a range of reasons. Uh, some of them are uh, related to lack of a job, lack of a house and so on. So right. it's, it's very important that those people can be linked in. Yes, of course, UNHCR maintains uh, uh, a watch and we, we want to advocate for them to be 
linked into the development right, programs and the reintegration the programs that LinkedIn. they need. All right. I'll, I'm afraid we are out of time, so we're going to have to end it on that thought of let's hope people can be linked in. I apologize, but we are out of time. Let's thank our guests, Fawzia Kufi, Ayaz Wazir, and Ariane Rumery. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now, it's goodbye.